Right guys, so um, the plan for today is to complete another social theory um, when we look at crime and deviance. This one is Marxism. But before we kick off with, uh, with Marxism, before we really get into it, it's, it's actually quite a straightforward, uh, it's actually quite a straightforward theory. Before we kick off and before we get into it, um, what I want to do is have a quick overview of what we've done so far. So we've had kind of a very general introduction to crime. We've looked at the different types of crime, which we're going to be revising a bit today. Um, we've looked at how um, you know the social order is maintained in society and how we try to prevent acts of deviance and criminality through you know sanctions and the like that we'd studied previously in um, the first section, socialization and culture. Um, and then we've started looking um, I think at the measures of crime and how crime are measured and then we've moved on to start looking at the theories on crime. So we will have done functionalism, we will have done subcultural theory and we will have done Marxism after today. Now what I would always suggest is it's always good to get the theories in and to really be fundamentally understanding the theories in their essence because Basically, there's a very good chance that a 15 mark question that they might ask you in the exam is going to be focused on theory and will be able to be answered by social theories. But also the, the important part in 15 markers is not just that you're able to give support to the statement that they give you, but also that you're able to give evaluative comparisons to something else. It's very straightforward. If you've got a question that says, and that focuses on one theory, you're not just leaving it at that. Yes, you are going to evaluate that theory itself, but it's also important that you compare to the other theories. So, let's take, for example, functionalism and subcultural theory. So, when we look at functionalism, which we know, you know is a consensus theory, everything's rose-tinted, everything's great, what is the cause for crime, really, for our functionalists? Well. A cause for crime you could suggest is strain between the goals and the, the means, your failure to achieve the, uh, the goals of society. Now, also remember, this is functionalist, isn't it? So the goals of society is something we have a consensus on. It's like you fail to achieve the norms and values of society, the nice house, the stable job, lots of money, the big car. Um, and you're under a significant amount of strain. And what does strain lead to? lead to? Well, a response to strain is going into a state of anime, okay? So, we can see here strain theory by Robert Merton and the idea of anime by Durkheim himself. Both key explanations for crime. And it links nicely into that kind of consensus view that our functionalists traditionally have. Remember though, there's a big problem with, with Merton's theory, is, and I suppose Durkheim to some degree, um, it's looking just at individuals. It's looking at the reasons why one individual person commits a crime. Now we know, looking about at you know, football hooligans on um, uh, a Saturday afternoon, that when they get into a fight, it's not really about individuals, okay? It's about being part of a group which might be covered by that in a second. Also remember that a big weakness to straying um, was the fact that it only explains crime for money. And also a problem with that is it doesn't really even look at um, crime committed by people who've already got the American dream, who've already got a lot of money. So, you know, we've got functionalism, the strain to achieve the goals of the American dream, lots and lots of money can lead to you getting under too much strain, snaps, you become a criminal type who's gonna go on an illegitimate career to try and get the cash that you want. And in that sense, when you do that, you fall into a state of anime because you're gonna be breaking the norms and values that we agree with on society. The norms like pay for things, <laughs> don't commit a crime, be nice to people. Um, now, hopefully what you can see is when we divide that over, one of the weaknesses here for functionalism 
is kind of dealt with by subcultural theory. So subcultural theory would say crime equals a group activity. And what's one of the reasons that you could do it? Well, it could be down to your treatment in education. Now I'm specifically, I can't remember how to write, it's been so long. Uh, your treatment in education, I'm specifically here thinking of Cohen and his idea of status frustration. I'm losing my head. His idea of status frustration. Now what Cohen is going to say, is he's going to say that young working class lads in education don't do very well and consequently they feel like they've got really low status in the, in the school and in society. So where am I going to get that status from? Well I'm going to get that status by committing delinquent and deviant acts with my friends. That could be vandalism, that could be fighting, it could be graffiti, it could be smashing windows. Now, note that now what we have is an explanation for, we will call it non-utilitarian crime, but crime without money as a goal. Because the reason that crime's taking place here is to gain back a little bit of status, perhaps. So, that's, you know, that's, that's a, I suppose, a bit of evaluation here. You start off with this idea, and then you can say, well, hang on a minute, so cultural theorists might say something different. They might be able to try and get rid of some of the, the weaknesses of, of, of the strain theory over there. Now, do remember that all of, remember, these are functionists, these are all going to be agreeing with the official crime statistics, aren't they? And they're all very accurate, because they all show that... Um, Young working class men are going to be the ones who are committing the most crime. Whereas today, we're going to look at how Marxism fits in. And hopefully, you've got a good idea what type of crime it might focus on and what it might say about the reasons for crime, what it might blame. And, and um, I suppose how it might act as a nice evaluation and a, a nice comparison to these other two theories that we've got here. So, first thing that I want you to do is turn to page 59 in your handbooks. Uh, and what you should see on page 59 is your uh, uh, page displayed like this. It says blue collar crime, white collar crime, corporate crime, and then you've got three circles here, each relating to one of those. I don't really know why I've done the circles, I just did it, I think, to take a bit of space. So what I would like you to do is give me a definition for blue collar, white collar, and corporate crime. And in the circles, give, you know, blue collar crime its own circle, white collar crime its own circle, and corporate crime its own circle. And I would like you to give me some examples of those crimes. Now I'm not going to go through those here on the board, I'm not going to tell you what the answers are. I want you to send me the answers for those. And then that way I can check, do a bit of revision on the different types of crime and check to make sure you've got a good understanding of these. So your very first activity that you're going to be doing today is completing that front page. And then when it's done, straight when it's done, don't send it me at the end of the lesson, send me a picture of that page being done. I will check it and um, I will give you feedback. And um, if you post it to me in a comment, that would be great. Okay. Now it says on the bottom of the PowerPoint, which types of crime are likely to be invisible crimes? It says crimes which are likely to be unknown to the public and unreported. Don't worry about that. We'll be discussing that in a minute because that's on the top of page 60. So um, what I'll do is get you to pause it now, do the first activity, send it to me, and then play this when, um, when you're done and when you've got your feedback from it. Go. All right, folks. So... The bit at the bottom says, um, <clears throat> what is invisible crime? Now, um, invisible crime, as it says, and I think it's worth here getting your definition written down on the top of page 60. Um, it says, crimes which are likely to be unknown to the public and unreported. Now, hopefully you've thought of a few examples, and there are some quite dark and, I mean, I suppose all crimes are quite dark and sinister, but there are some quite dark and sinister examples of invisible crime. 
And there are some other ones that hopefully you've got an idea in your head what they could be based on Marxism, the fact that we're looking at Marxism today. So if some of you put in invisible crimes, such as things like domestic violence, for example, is a good example of an invisible crime. Um, crime that we don't know is going on and that is often unreported. Prostitution is an invisible crime. You know, um, we, we don't see it taking place and neither of the parties involved are going to report the crime. So there are some kind of sexual and sexually motivated crimes that kind of fall under this. Domestic violence certainly falls under this. Um, so that is an example. So you can put those down. But in addition, I really want you to think about the fact that we're doing Marxism today. So what type of crime also do we think falls into that invisible, to be unknown to the public and unreported? Well, hopefully you're thinking about bigger crimes that might be white collar or might be corporate crimes. These often fall into the category of invisible crimes because you very rarely see people being aware of them or that they're unreported. So you might take, um, let's say, health and safety or issues with health and safety from a corporation, environmental crimes committed by corporations. Often the public will be unaware. They may never come to light. They may never go reported. If you're a company who, you know, is bending the rules a little bit, um, you know, I suppose recently I've just got into a situation with my flat where we discover 15 years later that they've not properly built the building and now it's our responsibility to put the building right. Well, I kind of feel like this is a bit unfair here. That's the type of crime that would be invisible. That kind of negligence when you build something and just if nobody finds out, happy days, you keep, you've kept a little bit more profit, lovely. Those are examples of invisible crimes as well. So, you know, negligence, uh, environmental offences. You might also say things like fraud and other white, white collar crimes like hacking or phishing scams and things on the internet where people might not even know that they've been a victim. You might have had your password hacked and they've been taking a little bit of money out of your account and you might, you might not know for, for years or months. Those could be invisible crimes. And obviously there's something that we're going to be discussing today. So, we kick off with a little bit of Marxism revision and that is going to be on page 60. So, um, very simply all you've got to do is, um, I mean you don't even have to draw these out, you can simply write it out. Draw and label it says the two different classes which Marxists believe exist. So obviously I hope you know your two classes by now for Marxism. You can just fill them out. What are the differences between those two particular groups? Okay? So, um, pause it now, get that box done, and then start to have a look at the questions um, that are on the board that we're going to come to in a second. So, remember, you've got your two social classes. Um, as quick as we possibly can now, because we know this off the top of our heads. The bourgeoisie, the proletariat, Basically, the owners versus the workers. Okay. The proletariat, the big group, bourgeoisie, the little one in the middle, they are at the centre of the universe. Here are our two social classes. So, it says in your books, Marxists believe that the current economic system called capitalism creates inequality between the two classes. We know that inequality exists between them, and inequality is due to capitalism. They would want to bring an end to that system and put in place a fairer system called, well, of course, Marx wants communism. Communism would be lovely for Marx. So capitalism and communism are your missing words. Remember, capitalism causes crime because it is a system, according to Marx, based on exploitation. So there's your basic overview of Marxism. Now. Here are a couple of questions that we're going to discuss together. The capitalist system promotes something called consumerism. Now, you've heard of being a consumer, but what does being a consumer mean? Well, we live in a consumer culture, and you can very much class the, the Western world, you can very much say Britain and America are giant consumer culture. And consumer cultures basically mean buying stuff. We seem to be cultures driven by purchasing goods and materials. That's what is important to us. We tend to find that these consumer cultures, people are very individual. Okay? 
They're very much focused on themselves. There's not really a lot of collective support. We tend to care about ourselves and our own more than we do about society perhaps as a whole. And you might see that in the British culture that you live in. Now, that's what we mean by consumerism, a system of just buying things. Now, it says here, how might consumerism, capitalism and poverty combine to make the working class commit crime? So how might the proletariat, the workers, the working class, or the subject class, depending on what you want to call it, obviously here we've got our ruling class, um, how might buying stuff, living in a culture where we buy things, capitalism, and of course poverty, combine to make working class people commit crime? So I'm hoping what you're thinking here is, well, if we live in a consumer culture where there's loads and loads of adverts, and there's loads and loads of, um, you know, promotion of goods that you should have, you should have the latest technology, you should have the trendiest clothes, you should have the latest um, iPhone or whatever it is, that's going to make people want those things. Okay? And, and actually, it might, and this might be a nice thing to add, it might lead to people feeling relative deprivation. You remember at the end of the stratification module, we looked at Townsend and his work on different types of uh, deprivation. And relative deprivation is a very important one. When you are relatively deprived, you are deprived compared to the people around you in your immediate community and society. So if there's all 20 of us in class, and I'm the only one who can't afford a phone, I am relatively deprived because everybody else has got the thing that I want. And relative deprivation might lead working class people to go commit crime to get the things that they need. Or in some cases to get the things that they need to live because they've got so they're in so much poverty that they can't afford food, etc. etc. Now, how might consumerism and capitalism combine to make ruling class people commit crime? We've looked at corporate crime, okay, and you looked at the Bhopal incident, which I remember um, was played out, and you saw a, a quick video about Bhopal, which was when the American company went and made a plant in India that was far less safe in terms of the health and safety regulations to its plant in Virginia in America. Something goes wrong, gas leak and a giant explosion, kills 25,000 people and 550,000 people are gas affected still to this day. Why does that lead to crime from the ruling classes? Maybe because capitalism makes you greedy. You want more and more. So if you're a corporation owned by the bourgeoisie, you want more and more. You're gonna cut corners and you're gonna try and maximize your profit. If you're an individual person committing a white collar crime, it's maybe because you're not satisfied with the fact that you've got loads in a big house. You want more, you want another car, you want an even bigger house, you want a swimming pool. So perhaps this is what happens in, the, um, in this system. So hopefully we've got page 60 um, filled out. We're going to move on to page 61. Now on page 61, um, it says, we know that blue collar crime is more commonly dealt with by the police. What reasons could there be for the high number of blue collar uh, arrests compared to white collar arrests or corporate crime? So as we've just looked at the reasons, what we said is the proletariat, this side, they're going to be doing blue collar crimes and they might be doing it because they're in poverty or they feel relative deprivation. Whereas over on this side, we're going to see white collar crimes or corporate crimes, possibly because of greed. The fact that they know there's more money out there, go and make all that money. So, here is um, a couple of questions, obviously, which is, what are the reasons for the high number of blue collar arrests compared to white collar arrests? So the first reason could be, perhaps more people commit blue collar crime than white collar crime, or corporate crime. Maybe. Maybe that's the reason that we see more people in the official statistics from this group saying that they're going to be the criminals than we do from this group. However, do we think that Marxists, remember Marxists who love the working class, who think they're down and being exploited by this horrible bourgeoisie, do we think the Marxists are going to say, 
yeah, yeah, probably more, um, more crime committed by this group. Maybe the Marxists are going to say something else. Now, um, what I would suggest is perhaps this. Perhaps they would say the police are less likely to target white collar crime as it's harder to detect and more costly. So perhaps the reason that white collar crimes and corporate crimes are more invisible is because the police don't have the skill, the expertise or the funds to properly go out there and deal with those crimes. It's always easier to solve a, you know, a, or to you know, break up a street fight or to go and arrest people in Manchester town centre on a Saturday night who've been drinking rather than try and figure out which corporations are committing environmental crime or fiddling their taxes. Perhaps victims of white collar crime might not know that they are even victims. We talked about this idea of invisible crimes. Perhaps you are the victim of an invisible crime now and you don't even know that it's happening because it's so sophisticated that you're unsure. You don't know that you're really the victim. And perhaps the media would rather see violent criminals get sent down than people committing clever crimes like fraud. Perhaps you yourselves do think that the worst person is the criminal who's violent on the street compared to the businessman who's siphoning off millions of pounds or damaging the environment or doing whatever else, committing acts of fraud. Perhaps you think that actually the worst person is the violent criminal. So, could you please make sure you've got those bullet points down before we move on to our, um, our final little section today, which is just the bottom of page 61. Well, we've got this lovely fellow. His name is Mark Neoclius, okay? Now, what Neoclius is going to say is that, and this is a nice little quote you can use, police target working class crimes. They work for and on behalf of the ruling class in society. He's going to say, and we need to say what this means, he's going to say that basically the police are a tool used by the bourgeoisie to maintain control and power. Because who are the police going to target? They're going to target this group. What's going to happen when there's a riot? They're going to target the group who are rioting, which is going to be this group. So there's very little ways in which the proletariat can kind of fight back. If you're a member of the bourgeoisie, if you're an owner, then you kind of got that kind of control and power to use the police. And maybe you do see it a lot, you know. Um, you know, I've seen lots of videos of the police moving people aside who are, you know, filming in shops and things. And, you know, they're saying, well, you're not allowed to film here or this is a, this is, this is, this is not public right away, like you need to get off our property and things like that. I mean, that happens quite a lot. So Neoclis is going to say, yeah, the police are going to target working class criminals. So his focus is going to be on the fact that the police are going to be targeting unfairly this group. So Mark Neoclis is one of your key writers, but your most important one is this fellow. His name is William Chambliss in the 1970s. He conducts a bit of research in the American city of Seattle. Um, his Seattle study is going to look at which groups in society are the most criminal and the ones who are most involved in criminality. And what he finds in his study in the 1970s is that some of the most powerful people in the city are the ones who are the biggest criminals. He finds that they're able to use bribery and use threats against the police to make sure, or against people who, uh, who might testify against them, to make sure that they don't get locked up, that they don't get charged, or that they don't get sent down for any kind of crime. And the term he uses to describe this, the term our Marxist would say describes this, is differential enforcement of the law. There is a different enforcement against you if you are a member of the bourgeoisie, compared to if you are a member of the proletariat. If you are bourgeoisie, you are looked after because the police are going to be targeting working class, not you. And even if you are doing something naughty, you have got the ability and the power to bribe your way or threaten your way out of that situation. And capitalism allows you to do that, remember, because it's going to give all the power through all the wealth to that one group. So, um, this is differential enforcement of the law. And our final kind of um, 
boxes to look at the Marxists on working class crime and the Marxists on ruling class crime. And here is our breakdown. So if you look at the Marxists on ruling class crime, um, what we'd be saying is the working class are targeted, the laws are created by the rich, and then the working class are punished. This is supported by Neoclius, who is going to say that the police have been a tool for capitalism and the ruling class since they first began. They work for the ruling class. And Marxists on ruling class crime are going to say, well, capitalist study shows there's different enforcement of the law. That actually the ruling class and the bourgeoisie are not held to the same standard and that white collar criminals like the bourgeoisie are able to get away with crime and bribe their way out. Um, and even in, as it says here in Chambliss's study, um, it's white collar crime, but also some of the blue collar crime that the, that the bourgeoisie are involved with. So they're involved with violence as well, but they get, they pay other people to do it for them. So this is our Marxist perspective on crime. And it leads us very nicely in to this question. So what I'm going to be asking you to do today so I think that Marxism is, is quite straightforward. What I'm going to ask you to do is look at the 15 marker that I've attached in this particular thread. And that 15 marker is this. Crime is caused because the rich exploit the poor. Do you agree? 15 marks. Now remember, the structure of a 15 mark question is thus. Introduction, very, 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 very brief. The briefest thing possible, because you're not going to pick up lots of marks for your uh, introduction. Then what you've got to do is you've got to agree with the point of view, agree with that statement, and then you've got to at least disagree twice more. So you end up with a bit of a balance. So you go intro, paragraph one, agree, paragraph two, disagree, paragraph three, disagree, and you need a conclusion, a measured conclusion. Now what I'm going to do to you um, is, or do it for you, what I'm going to do to you is cause you extreme pain by making you do an essay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, ask you to um, use the, um, the plan that I've sent out. Okay? Now on that plan it breaks down all of the sections that you are going to write here um, and note that Right, crime is caused because the rich exploit the poor. We know that's going to be Marxism after today. We know that the rich are able to exploit their position. We know it because of Chambliss' study into the differential uh, enforcement of the law, the fact that Neoclis is going to say that the police are a tool for the ruling class, and the fact that exploitation exists, which gives the bourgeoisie the power to kind of control the police and to get away with their crimes, which maybe working class people wouldn't be able to. So you know Marxism, Marxism is going to be the paragraph which agrees with this. So who's going to disagree? Well, functionalism and subcultural theory, as we said at the very start, are saying something different. For Marxists, it's the rich exploiting the poor. For functionalists, it's going to be the strain to achieve the goals that we set and the things that we value in society. For subcultural theory, it's all going to be about crime in groups that might even be crime that um, is not for any kind of monetary gain. It's crime to get yourself some status that you're going to do through vandalism. And you'll be able to see that each of these are going to be saying something different. Now, note, if that question says crime is caused by um, groups of delinquents in subcultures, all you would do is change the order of your argument. Okay. Um, oh, there was one final thing. This will actually get people who, um, who have been listening or not. Um, if you look at the bottom of page 61, on my, uh, for some reason, it's deleted the section. I think it's hidden behind the table, which says evaluation. Now, looking at William Chambliss's research, there's always some time to put in a bit of evaluation, which we've got into all of our theories, which you can put at the end of your paragraph. What's the weakness of this theory before you compare it to the next one? 
Um, William Chambliss' study is in one city in America. What is the problem with just studying one city in America? The second issue with William Chambliss' research is it was done in the 1970s. What's the problem with that? So hopefully you can put down underneath your table just a couple of quick evaluation points, quick weaknesses that you might think of of uh, William Chambliss' um, uh, um, theory. So I'm going to send this out. And what I want you to do is I want you to just do a very rough plan. Who are you going to write? What are you going to say in this? You can use the, um, you know, my points as kind of tips where to go. And then I would like you to send me a copy of the plan, please. Okay? So a copy of that plan um, or a copy of a rough plan. You don't have to do it on that one. You can write it out yourself and put your paragraphs on. But a copy of your plan. So by the end of the lesson today, the first thing that you'd send me is um, page 59 complete. You would have done that at the start. Then to conclude, on page 62, you've got uh, like an empty page which has got space for a plan. And I want you to use this, which I will send out separately, to make me a plan on that page. You don't have to write it out yet. You don't have to write it out. You may be doing so in the future, but not today. So those are the two things that I want you to, to get done for me. As always, I'll be online if there are any problems. If not, um, I will... Um, I'll speak to you next week.